Imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge. It's what Albert Einstein said. It is crucial to be able to see or at least to glance over the horizon, to see the challenges that are ahead of us that are yet to come, to we can come up with innovative solutions, to we can come up with the ideas. And that's naturally imagination. But that would not be enough. We need skill and we need knowledge to turn the idea into something real, to work it out, to come up with unique solutions and make the world a better place. But the true power, the true potential, is not only in imagination or in knowledge. It's in cooperation. It's in using the imagination, using the skill and the knowledge for the greater good. And that's when research infrastructures come into play. Among other things, one of the reasons they were founded is because they are supposed to make sure that we use full potential of imagination, full potential of skills and knowledge, as well as greater and greater cooperation. And that's what we hope to achieve here today, tomorrow, and on Friday as well. We want to learn. We want to do our best to you can learn from each other, so you can share experience and make sure that you can strengthen the experience and strengthen the collaboration, to have tools to make the world a better place. And I'm very happy that you decided to come, that you decided to join us here in Brno in the Czech Republic for the International Conference on Research Infrastructure 2022. Distinguished speakers, your guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to welcome you to the Czech Republic. It's a great honor to welcome you to Brno. Good afternoon to you all. Welcome. We have 450 delegates here on site. Over 600 are joining us online. Thank you very much for doing so, and I hope you will have a great time doing so during today's tomorrow's as well as during the Friday's program. We want you to make the conference the way it is important and interesting to you. We want you to shape the conference. So do not hesitate to ask questions. If you are here uh, on site, just raise your hand. We will give you the microphone and you can ask the question. If you are joining us online or if you want to ask the question online, don't hesitate at all. Just go to the website of ICRI 2022 or download the official app of ICRI 2022. You can find it in the App Store as well as in Google Play and you can use it to check out what's happening. Always just find the plenary session that you are interested in Always find just the discussion, just the part of the program that you are interested in. Click questions and ask the question you are interested in. So you can learn as much as possible. The app is very useful for you also concerning the program because everything that is changing will be changed in the program. You can also find some tips, some various activities that you can join so you can have the most pleasant stay here in Brno as part of ICRI 2022. We have nearly 40 site and satellite events that are part of ICRI 2022, as well as uh, site visits in Brno based uh, research infrastructures. And for the very first time, we have also a special program for public engagement. Every day during the whole week, scientists talk to general public to make them more aware concerning research infrastructures. All you can find in the official app. We will go from macro to micro perspective. And we will start with the macro perspective today. Our first speaker has his background in international law. He used to be director of the Institute of State and Law of the Czechoslovak and Czech Academy of Scientists. Of Science, excuse me. He served as a member of the Permanent Corps of Arbitration in The Hague and as a representative of the Czech Republic in EU organization. Then he decided to take the path of a politician. He was uh, elected to the Parliament of the Czech Republic and now he serves as the Czech Minister of Education, Youth and Sports, Mr. Vladimir Balaš. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Welcome to ICRI. The floor is yours. Is it a proper way? Yes. Precise way. Thank you very much for the invitation. We might be thinking why international lawyer is interested in issues you are dealing with uh, today and uh, in coming days. Um, but even for international lawyers and for lawyers, uh, you can find some job to do, of course, and for example, we deal with, uh, with the corporation model for, 
for research infrastructures, especially, and it's kind of sui generis uh, model, so, and about the, the protection of, of, uh, uh, of uh, how to say it, uh, of intellectual property, <laughs> and uh, there are some other issues dealing with transformation and other, so. But uh, uh, I'm here definitely because I've got the position of Minister of Education and I feel that this conference is really important and it's important not only for the Czech Republic and it, it is important of course also for, uh, for Europe and, for, and globally I think and uh, that uh, the synergies that are one of the mottos of our presidency are that important that we cannot really sort out uh, the challenges of current world without cooperating together. So this is why I'm here. So esteemed colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me warmly uh, welcome you to Brno, uh, the capital of Moravia, actually one of the capitals. And, and there are some other important towns and uh, Olomouc I, I really also can recommend you to visit. It's worth of seeing, seat of Archbishop. And, um, uh, but Brno has this privilege to, to host uh, this year's uh, International Conference on Research Infrastructures, and there is really good reason why it is Brno, because uh, we have also some such infrastructures here in Brno, and uh, Brno, uh, you have probably noticed this really university town, and uh, there are also some institutes of, of uh, Academy of Sciences, and, and uh, it's really a very progressive town, that really understands that uh, support of, of uh, education and research is important. So, and uh, so I'm also extremely glad that we have such a large audience uh, attending uh, this event in person, um, and uh, including those that uh, are from overseas and uh, other non-European countries and with hundreds of followers watching the live web stream on the conference website. I sincerely hope uh, you will enjoy the conference as well as the side events accompanying the main program and those of you who arrived to Brno will also spend a pleasant time in the historical city, uh, an historical city center with uh, some traditional and I had prepared Czech uh, beverages and meals, but we are in Moravia. Oh, Mor but no, it's not Moravia, in, in fact. So let's say Moravian and Czech, or local, uh, local beverages and meals. And uh, apart from from beer, which is traditional everywhere in the Czech Republic, it's also known for good wine here. So, uh, so research infrastructures uh, belong among the top priority uh, policy making areas uh, that the Czech Republic. Um, chairing the Council of uh, European Union uh, in the second semester of this year uh, uh, for the presidency agenda. So we've chosen this because we really feel it is important. So that's uh, quite, quite understandable that uh, we could not just avoid uh, something that uh, is really closely linked to, to, to the main motto, which is also synergies in research and innovation. So and this is why uh, why uh, research infrastructures play such an important role for us. And uh, so it's then very topical um, to host the ICRI conference as one of the flagship uh, Czech EU Council presidency events, and it's also quite understandable. And as I said already, neither Brno has been chosen as a venue for holding this event by a pure chance. Uh, for more than a decade, Brno has been an emerging science and technology hub in the Central Europe, competing with Prague and very successfully. <laughs> and we've got quite kind of uh, healthy competition, uh, not only in, in your areas, but also uh, my students at the law school are competing with these Brno Masaryk University students, and we have a lot of fun, and it really pushes us forward. And uh, so Brno is, of course, flourishing town now, and uh, uh, it's not only due to heavy investments in the, in the industry, but also uh, investment in, in uh, knowledge economy, 
and uh, it's also thanks to uh, European Union cohesion policy instruments, and it is also important for us. Uh, against this background, I'm deeply convinced that Berno will provide, uh, provide you with excellent premises for uh, all the happenings this week, and you also have a number of unique opportunities to have hands-on experience with uh, local research infrastructures hosted by the Masaryk University, uh, the Central European Institute of Technology, and other research institutes based here in Brno. Um, speaking about it, so both Masaryk University and uh, the Central European Institute of Technology are our local hosts, and it goes without saying that they deserve our most sincere appreciation uh, for all the hard work without which this conference would hardly happen. Uh, to touch the, the, the contents of the ICFI conference agenda, it's very rich and it will focus on a number of research infrastructure policy making issues of utmost importance. When it comes uh, to the thematic areas, it is obvious that we have to start with the topic of the COVID-19 pandemic and other highly contagious infectious disease. Uh, secondly, the need for mitigation and adaptation to the climate change calls for our attention, and as well as the green transition and digital transformation of our uh, societies and economies. I mean, it's, it's sometimes uh, not considered as a polite word for politicians, but I think uh, it's just short, uh, short-sighted uh, ideas of some politicians who don't support such an attitude, such an approach. Uh, regarding the policy-making areas, uh, the program of the ICRI conference will focus on societal and economic benefits and impacts of research infrastructures, and uh, I think uh, I don't have to explain you what are those benefits. Uh, another area that we'll be exploring is the research infrastructure ecosystem and how to better integrate large-scale and mid- and small-sized facilities in it. And we we'll also aim at debating transnational access to research infrastructures, and not to mention uh, the field of sharing scientific data internationally and globally. And it is important. Uh, we are, of course, in Europe at least, uh, society of knowledge, but uh, we are not that rich to to be uh, able to waste potential capacity and not to share information, not to put people together, and not to help uh, to overcome our challenges we are currently facing. So the exchanges of opinions will happen at both the plenary sessions and the parallel breakout sessions to enable participants dive really deep in the agenda and touch the critical points of it. There will be nearly 100 speakers intervening in the discussions, either in the role of keynote speakers, panelists, or moderators, all of them being leading research infrastructure experts in Europe and all around the world. And having said that, I truly believe there's a huge potential to progress in many policy-making areas and set out key strategic orientations uh, for further advancement of the global research infrastructure ecosystem. Uh, fostering of a global research infrastructure ecosystem has already been happening at various platforms. Uh, to mention just a few of them from the European perspective, the, the critical body is the European Strategy Forum uh, on Research Infrastructures, ASFRI, and uh, we host this event as well. And at the international level, uh, tremendous work is being done by the OECD Global Science Forum or by the group of senior officials or uh, global research infrastructures under the group of seven, G7. And uh, the ICRI conference usually also chips in uh, and thus contributing to a broad range of fora where global research infrastructure ecosystem is addressed. So now 
we have the role of international law, in fact, so institutional support globally is also important. So, so I, I, I feel much better now. <laughs> so a lot has uh, already been done, but there are much more challenges ahead of us waiting for our action. Uh, that's also why we prepared the so-called Bernard Declaration on fostering a global uh, ecosystem of research infrastructures to further incentivize necessary actions. It's not just a, a pure coincidence that there is, there is this Bernard Declaration. Uh, during our term as the presidency of the Council of the European Union, Czechia has been facilitating debates leading to the adoption of the Council conclusions on research infrastructures in order to outline a set of policy orientations on further enhancement of the European research infrastructure ecosystem. And uh, whereas these Council conclusions are meant to address the European stakeholders, the ambition of the Czech Presidency is to approach global stakeholders too, which is why there is the Bono Declaration calling on you research infrastructure stakeholders all around the globe to join forces and elaborate on the global research infrastructure ecosystem. Uh, I won't spend more time on the Brno Declaration uh, now as there is a detailed PowerPoint uh, presentation later on, uh, the conference agenda, uh, to introduce you deeply in the genesis and contents of this document. Uh, and before concluding my brief introduction, let me state uh, that I'm very happy that the European Commission has strongly supported Czechia in this endeavor to organize the ICRI 2022 conference, including a, fi a financial contribution granted from the Horizon Europe Framework Program. And uh, it's been highly appreci appreciated, and uh, I sincerely believe we live up to our commitment from the grant application and hold a success event. Uh, I'm not quite sure. We've uh, been promised that uh, uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel will join us at least uh, online. I'm not quite sure whether she will. And if not, uh, we hope that um, she will recover soon. Uh, as I understand, she really felt badly. And uh, she will definitely join us next time. And, we have, uh, and she has uh, a lot of things to, to discuss with you and with all of us. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for coming to Brno or joining the live web stream. And thank you very much for your trust you've put in this conference. And let me jointly make it a successful event and the time well spent. So enjoy Brno. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir Balash, the Minister of Education, Youth and Sports of the Government of the Czech Republic. Unfortunately, as he mentioned, uh, Maria Gabriela is not available to join us because she fell ill, so unfortunately she cannot join us. But we will have the perspective of European Commission here in Brno, thanks to the uh, online uh, online statement and online uh, uh, potentially even interview with uh, Sinja Razzo, uh, who is the Acting Director General for Research and Innovation. Dr. Razzo, are we online? Dear Minister Balash, uh, dear international government represent, uh, representatives, dear research community, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, uh, as said, uh, Commissioner Gabriel uh, would have loved to be with you uh, today for this um, opening statement. Unfortunately, she's unable to do so, uh, but I would be happy to, to read uh, to you uh, her welcoming statement, and later on I will also join uh, the, the panel uh, discussion. Uh, so the, her uh, welcoming speech uh, now uh, will, will go like this. I would like to thank the Czech Presidency of the EU for hosting the international event on research infrastructures. Allow me to send a big thank you uh, to our Canadian colleagues who kept ICRI alive during the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic showed the importance of international cooperation and the role of research infrastructures. Our long-term challenges of climate change and digital transformation 
that risk to accentuate social inequalities are more important than ever. The Russian war in Ukraine recall us the urgency to use our scientific knowledge to foster the transition towards a sustainable economy. Europe is ready to take its responsibilities to promote the global alignment on key values of openness, integrity, and enhancing access to knowledge. They are at the base of the trust we need in our global cooperation and research infrastructures have a great role to play. We are sharing investments on unique and large-scale uh, uh, large scientific instruments, which are complex and expensive, like ITER or lately uh, the Square Kilometer Array radio telescope. Other excellent examples of international collaboration on in environmental monitoring infrastructures include the Argo program of drifting floats and the Global Atmosphere Watch or Global Ecosystem Research Infrastructure. Similar collaborations supported by EU research funding have emerged in the health domain, like the Global Bioimaging Network addressing viruses and infection diseases. We need to work further on the educational dimension of research infrastructures. We must facilitate partnerships with higher education to train the next generation of scientists and innovators. This is an important point for me as commissioner, also for education, and for which I ask your support. I'm quoting now commissioner here. Uh, I would like to thank the Czech Presidency of the EU for leading the preparation of the Brno Declaration, which will be published today, and I'm happy to express on behalf of the Commission our full support. I'm confident uh, that this conference is an excellent opportunity to discuss in a multilateral context the way forward and to underline how much peaceful collaboration based on the values we share is precious to all of us. Thank you for your kind attention. I wish you a very interesting event and fruitful discussions. Thank you on behalf of the Commission. Thank you very much, and I will add that uh, Senior Razzo will join us for the panel discussion afterwards the, after the initial talks. So if you have any questions for her, if you have any questions for the European Commission, do not wait for anything. Download the app ECRI 2022 or use the website and send your question to you. Can get the answers you are seeking for. I promised the macro perspective. That's why various regions of the world need to be represented. Let's go to Canada. Canadian a professional engineer who has experience from academia as well as private sector. Since 2020, she has been vice president for programs and planning of Canada Foundation for Innovation. Claire Samson. Dr. Samson, thank you very much for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, bonjour, dobry den. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today on behalf of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Je suis ravie d'être ici aujourd'hui parmi vous au nom de la Fondation Canadienne pour l'Innovation. The CFI is the organization that hosted the fifth international conference on research infrastructure uh, virtually from Canada in 2021. Today, it is my great pleasure to be here in person to hand over this important role of host to the Czech Republic. This conference is the world's preeminent forum for discussing research infrastructures. It is attended by the foremost experts in this area from across the globe. And it makes a critical contribution to science and research at a time in human history when, we need, when the need for new insights and innovation has never been more pressing. What's more, I'm sure this year's organizers would attest to the fact that putting together an international event of this type and scale is no easy feat. 
There are logistics to be sorted out, timelines to be met, communications to be shared, venues to book. And I'm happy to say, since many of us are meeting in person this year, delicious Czech menus to plan. And we can't forget the months of behind the scenes work by the ICRI program committee. They have developed what I think will be a truly engaging and inspiring program that includes experts from multiple disciplines in many countries who will bring their unique perspectives to the most critical issues facing global research infrastructure. As I said, it is, not, it, it is no easy feat, but it is certainly one that will be rewarding for everyone attending in person and virtually. So on behalf of the CFI and all our research partners on the other side of the Atlantic, I want to extend our warm congratulations and thanks to the organizer of ICRI 2022. Je tiens à adresser nos chaleureuses félicitations et nos remerciements sincères aux organisateurs et aux organisatrices de l'ICRI 2022. Whether you are participating with us here in Brno or joining us virtually for your corner of the globe, I wish us all the best of luck in the coming days for an excellent and productive conference. Je nous souhaite à tous et à toutes une excellente et productive conférence pendant les trois prochaines journées. Thank you. Merci. Jay Kudju. <laughs> Thank you. Our language is horrible, isn't it? I wouldn't go that far. I would. <laughs> I would. I would. Yeah, I truly would. How, for how long have you been to Czech Republic? When did you arrive? I arrived Sunday morning. On Sunday morning. So you probably were taught the most important word in the Czech language, weren't you? Yes, I'm learning one word a day, roughly. Okay. <laughs> have you been learned uh, the word, have you been taught, sorry, the word pivot? Yes, I'm looking yeah. forward for a pivot tonight. I will sure you are. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and merci beaucoup pour, pour votre exposé. C'était vraiment magnifique. Merci beaucoup encore une fois. We will go uh, from Canada to South Africa. The next speaker is a public policy and strategy manager with a focus on science, technology, and innovation, as well as public management and governance. Since 2006, he has been employed at South African Department of Science and Innovation. Currently, he serves as Deputy Director General responsible for research development and support. Imran Patel. Thank you very much for coming to Brno. Please. Um, good afternoon, and it gives me great pleasure to address uh, ICRI. Uh, I'm not going to attempt the uh, different languages. I'm terrible at languages. Um, but uh, um, just to say uh, good afternoon. Um, as the speaker indicated, I come from South Africa on the southern tip of, 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 of the continent. And as a small country, we've had a very active and vibrant research infrastructures program uh, for more than three, four decades. And during the time of our research infrastructures work, we've had a very, very strong uh, commitment to international cooperation. So I'd like to extend my thanks to the, to the Czech Republic for organizing this very, very important conference and look forward to the engagements on different aspects that seems to occupy us, whether we're at the southern tip of Africa or whether we're in, in, in Canada. And some of those elements that I have picked up that I'm really looking forward to having engagements on is, for example, the social license to generate and develop research infrastructures. Our communities, our taxpayers fund these large infrastructures. We need a way of ensuring that we, we, we get this done. We also need to look at Im impact and sustainability, and I'm glad that the program has a number of sessions in, in South Africa with my, my colleagues here from the NRF and the 
DSI and some of our entities will be engaging in some of those sections, looking at the issue of impact. And then finally, uh, the key issue around human capital uh, development, uh, that's core. At South Africa, we have an ecosystem of infrastructures, and, and I'm hoping that during the panel discussion we'll be able to share this, ranging from our participation in a big research infrastructure like the Square Kilometre Array, and we thank the number of partners who are here who are with us. But in addition to that, we have our own internal local uh, South African research infrastructures roadmap. We have a number of international research partners. We've been uh, participating in CERN. Uh, we have the cyber infrastructure program. So we have the different elements of a very strong research infrastructure program. And, and thankfully, this research infrastructure program has support, but obviously, we need to be able to do it uh, uh, in, in a greater way. Moving forward, uh, and, and as the, the, the minister uh, uh, highlighted, there are a number of global challenges that we need to confront, and these are the same global challenges that confront us. Climate change, health, and in terms of climate change, mo both, both mitigation and adaptation, very importantly, um, health uh, in terms of the pandemic uh, response. But also in terms of South Africa, I think a big part of what we need to build on, and it's part of what I would want us to, 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 to also have a discussion on, is this issue of society building or nation building in our instances. Uh, societies are fracturing, uh, uh, um, research has a very, very important role to play, and I'm glad to see in, in, in a number of research infrastructures program a very strong focus, not just on the physical sciences, but on the humanities and the social sciences. So moving forward, we look forward to engaging more critically on the challenges that we face as well, and that includes ensuring that we continually refine and enhance the the, 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 the socio-economic benefit of research infrastructures, and we think we have some lessons in this regard, and also a lot to learn. Also, how to, to, to strengthen international cooperation, and the uh, Bruno Declaration will help in that regard, and I hope that, that we would be able to, 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 to benefit from that. The issue of sustainability, including finding resources from, from, from governments continuously, but from other, other role players, including industry. Uh, human capital development needs to continue. Uh, open science uh, has become increasingly important, and I think the research infrastructures uh, need to be able to do this here. So on that basis, I, I look forward to the engagements over the next couple of days and, and, and hope that through the panel discussion, we'll be able to explore some of these issues a lot more and, and, and kind of confront the challenges. I once again would like to, to thank the organizers for bringing us together and in particular uh, for ensuring that ICRI lives up to his name in terms of bringing people together from different parts of the world uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, to, to share the stage with, with a, a number of colleagues from, from west to, to, to east. So look forward to the panel discussion, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and we will add uh, one more perspective here on site, and then we will have one more speaker who will join us online. Now we have a speaker who has more than 30 years of experience in international cooperation, working with local and national governments as well as international organizations. Among others, she has been working in the EU framework program, conducting courses and training, especially in countries of Latin America and Caribbean. Since 2020, she has been the manager of the Uruguayan Agency for International Cooperation. Claudia Romano. Thank you very much for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank to the organization for the invitation. It's really a honor to participate in this important event, to share our experience in research infrastructure, international cooperation. Collaboration at regional and global level face multiple challenges, but also have open opportunities. For Latin American and the Caribbean countries, these opportunities have been explored by generating network to support the development of research infrastructures. This network offers a space to share information, 
policies and activities happening all over the world. I would like to share with you some reflection on the work we have been doing, highlighting more specifically what we have learned in Latin American and Caribbean countries, especially in collaboration with the UAE, but certainly with global relevance. The political relation of the CELAC region with the UAE in science, technology, and innovation is carried out through the senior official meeting, like some. The SOM has participation of governmental officials responsible for science policy in our country and has met regularly since 2013, even during the pandemic time. The work of the SOM is structured in four pillars, research infrastructure, research mobility, innovation, and global challenges. As our colleagues say, what are the global challenges? Climate change, environment, sustainable, and, and the same than the other colleagues say. The joint initiative in research and innovation, which aims to change EU select cooperation on science and research developed strategic roadmap 2021 and, uh, and 2023. That give a framework to facilitate bi-regional collaboration and dialogue based on common priority encourage mutual policy learning. This prioritization helped to establish a strategic and action-oriented approach about the authority at each individual country, with benefits in better coordination at the regional level, not only CELAT, and the international level too. In the pillar of the research infrastructure, the work of the, of the SOM received a very important support from the working group CELAC UE. Create in 2017 provides the opportunity for bi regional policy coordination. The groups aims to align and harmonize regional policies, sharing best practices in policy development and mapping research infrastructure to achieve the greatest use of available information technology technologies within and outside the region. The infrastructure available to research in lag countries e development at different speed in different areas of knowledge and in different regions of the continent. The region presents important asymmetries in the development of its infrastructure. The challengers is identific identify good practices and successful strategic action in order to continue working together, strengthen the existing network and create a new ones strategic in the less developed countries. For all of this, international cooperation is crucial, as well as strategic decision making. Another important initiative is the project Resinfra EU CELAC, supported by the Horizon 2020, by a coordinator by Spain, with partners for 14 countries, EU and LAC uh, areas contributing to increased collaboration among existing scientific and academic networks. The active participation of more than 700 people from both regions in meetings and seminars, uh, meeting and seminar, sorry. Uh, uh, on relevant topics such as health, technology, biotechnology, has facilitated technical exchange for construction and awareness as joint EU LAC agenda, involving authorities and research. Resinfra produce, produce a mapping of national and regional research infrastructure policy, strategic and corresponding plan, including financing mechanisms that could be used to support the construction of an operation of future research infrastructure in EU and LAC countries. We developed four pilot linked with existing research infrastructure, instruct ERIC uh, in field of structural bio biology, ERIS in heritage, RECAP high performance computing, LifeWatch ecosystem and biodiversity. It has a sustainable plan to support and strengthen the EULA collaboration with the objective to inform and support the SOM, as well as establish link with group related to research infrastructure 
such as senior official meeting group, uh, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the Global Science Forum, and ESFRI. To give a tangible example of a result of this project, the concept of region, regional hub has been conceived through research activity. Hub serves as bridge, as bridge between research and the infrastructure they need. The Institute Pasteur in Uruguay is setting up one of the first of such, such regional link. Main challenges and opportunities, keeping in mind the work we have done, with, uh, we pinpoint the, follow, the following challenger. One, use the capability that have been generated for the working group and for the Resinfra project to, to solve persistent problems in the region. We have huge potential at the global scale, but need clear goals to con commun convince decision makers that investing in research infrastructure can be a game changer. We need further work to define and generate change of value. Why? Because it's necessary to make a production and trade of good from Latin America to the world. Two, carry out intra-regional work in LAC because it's important to, uh, to overcome the asymmetries that still persist among, among LAC countries, achievement complementary infrastructure. Three, extend the collaboration with other regions like Canadian, Africa, Oceania, Asia. Four, work in a multi-stakeholder approach involving policy makers, research, manager of infrastructure, all together have to work all together because all of us can give some specific capabilities. Uh, four, of our, work with ecosystem hotspots in areas with the contribution of the lack country is key, for example, in, ter in terms of biodiversity, uh, Amazon rainforest of the 12 most countries with the highest biodiversity in the world, half as in Latin America. Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, climate change is around the world this problem. Ocean, marine science, Argentina, Chile, food production, all the continent. Health boosted by modern technologies as, such as integrate bioimaging hub, like Pasteur. Latin America and the Caribbean has been one of the region hardest hit by the health and the economic crisis generated by the coronavirus pandemic. Having research infrastructure in our LAC countries was essential to respond to the pandemic. Finally, I would like to emphasize, emphasize that it's necessary to encourage communication between the different actors. It's relevant to have open access to data as a catalyst for free and open collaboration between region and as, and as a key contribution to better science. Last but not least, I highlight that we have to continue working and demonstrating the importance and benefits of intra-regional, bi-regional and global cooperation in the development of our country and having people as the focus, who are the main beneficiary, beneficiaries and actors of the public policy. This is our reason for beginning with United Nations SDG as our roadmap to foster fair and inclusive knowledge transfer to not leave one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> for those who did not hear, I was just uh, thanking you for the attention in Spanish and uh, hopefully promising even add a Spanish version. Did I understand? My Spanish is really wonky, to, to, be, to be honest, so I wasn't really certain concerning the, the, the translation. Uh, we have promised the macro perspective. We had representatives who will join you in the discussion, and you have been sending some questions. Do not hesitate to ask more. I promise that I will always put your questions in front of mine, so you can truly learn what you want to learn during the debate. We have talked about uh, the perspective of European Commission, about the uh, perspective of Europe, Latin America, Canada, Africa. Let's go to Australia. Our next speaker is a physicist with major research achievements in superconductors and sensors, and she was able to transfer 
her research into reality with a great significance. Now, today, she is uh, the Australia's chief scientist, now representing Australian government, joining us live. It is Katie Foley. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, so hello everybody, it's great to be here. I'm just going to begin, in Australia we always begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on and where we are across Australia. I'm on the lands of the Ngunnawal people in Canberra in Australia and I want to pay my respects to those uh, traditional custodians of the lands where we're on, the elders who looked after them in the past, those who are looking after lands now and those who are looking after lands in the future. And what you're looking at there is one of the oldest structures on earth. It is the fish traps in the northern part of New South Wales, where uh, they've been in existence for over 20,000 years, being able to uh, be able to manage ecosystems, be able to uh, look at fish and make them available for, uh, for Indigenous people for over many decades or many millennia. So it's, they're much older than the uh, pyramids and it's one of the, it was thought to be the oldest engineered structure on earth. But today I want to begin by um, talking to you about the, the big end of town. And uh, it's been wonderful to be able to be here with you, even though I am only here in, um, in video form. But I want to talk about big infrastructure that Australia engages with, both this hosting, building and uh, in engaging with the national approach as well as internationally. And as Australia um, is talking to an international audience, I feel I might just give you a bit of a preface by letting you know that Australians actually have a big fascination for, um, for uh, real things that are, I think you could say big. And it's not just historic landmarks, but also um, we get attached to things which are a bit local. And I'll just show you some examples. So in Australia, we have uh, the big ram, uh, the big banana, uh, the big prawn, and it's estimated to be about 230 big objects around our country in every state and territory. And I have to say that my personal favorite one is uh, the big potato. So if ever you come to Australia, you can be sure there's big things there. But we're actually also interested in big infrastructure because we know that's where we push the boundaries of our knowledge and how we're able to really understand our world and also lead to great outcomes. And of course, most of that infrastructure needs to be very large. And so uh, we are, uh, uh, we know that infrastructure is of great importance for Australia and we're very um, pleased to be playing host to many of them either at, in Australia or contributing to other infrastructure internationally. So we are an active contributor to international science projects um, in a very wide range of fields. For example, what you're looking at there is a square kilometre array. And we're very honoured to be op an operating partner of the SKA Low Telescope, as well as hosting the telescope itself at our Murchison Radio Astronomy uh, Observatory in Western Australia. Now it's not built yet, so this is a, a picture of what it will look like, and it consists of an array of 131,072 Christmas tree shaped antennas grouped in 512 stations. And the SKA Low will be by far the largest telescope ever built as it's measured by its total area. And as a result, we'll be able to peer back in time further than ever before. So that's the local one, but we've also had involvement with CERN's Large Hadron Collider, particularly the Atlas detector, which you're looking at here. It's 46 metres long, um, 25 metres high, 25 metres wide, and, and weighs about 7,000 tonnes. And this detector um, is the largest volume particle detector ever constructed. And Australian scientists were involved from the beginning. So it was led by Jeff Taylor from the University of Melbourne and Kevin Barbell from Sydney University. And they helped to design the detectors and their shielding, developing software to model the behavior of the detector and developing software that triggers the collection of information. So that's where it's really important to be able to engage internationally. 
but it's also important for us to have our landmark research infrastructure, which we use for regular research, such as the Australian synchrotron, or our, which you can see there in the main part of the picture, or our open pool Australian light water, or called Opal nuclear reactor. Um, these are examples of large infrastructure, but the photo also shows in the, oh, just a little bit in the far right hand corner, you just see the edge of it. It's, um, and that's the Australian National Fabrication Facility, which also is part of our national infrastructure. So just like our big beloved banana, we know that big research infrastructure is more than just a building. It's a virtuous investment in so, with so many benefits. The first benefit is obvious, and that is research infrastructure is inv an invaluable source of innovation and discovery. And that's why we build it. But there's a lot of other important things that research infrastructure enables. It gives many big infrastructure projects, um, out, uh, uh, they are built outside metro areas. And these projects are often um, supporting regional and global economies, and not just through their construction, but also through the ongoing establishment of supply chains and higher education job opportunities. A really good example is the other part of the square kilometre array, uh, which is in South Africa. But the uplift in education and tech is going beyond just South Africa. And this project is uh, supporting Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, and Zambia. Um, and these countries are participating in ways that are allowing them to refurbish old telecommunication dishes and they're training new generations of engineers and astronomers in the process. It's also easy to overlook that the current world today would be impossible without research infrastructure. From radioactive medicines that are produced from nuclear reactors to gene therapies that can only exist off the back of the Human Genome pro Project. And the way we live is increasingly enabled by big research infrastructure projects. I think all of us are aware that there are so many technologies developed that have advanced basic scientific agendas. And these discoveries have come about because of big projects. And two examples are, of course, radio astronomy that led to us having a capability that discovered Wi-Fi. And then, of course, CERN, which led to the um, the use of the internet and the creation of that. But there are challenges. And these are things such as making sure that we can maintain this equipment at state of the art and upgrading it, managing what to do with these major pieces of infrastructure when they get to the end of their life, making sure that we have the funding so that we can uh, undertake either maintenance or build them in the first place. The other is also making sure that we control empire building, that it doesn't lead to unintended outcomes with individuals not necessarily sharing things in the way we need to for the best benefit. Uh, we also need to understand how research infrastructure can support legitimate career paths, both with recognition and support for those who are actually operating the equipment. Uh, there also is our uh, importance of having the cross country collaborations, but to get that to work, we need to make sure that we're we have the support in each country, the timing and lining this all up so that we're able to achieve this. And you can see that in the case of the SKA and, and many other large infrastructure international projects, this can take many years. And of course, there's the never ending issue of geopolitics. In Australia, we have an approach where uh, much of our infrastructure is managed in a collective way. Because we have a low population base, about the same size population as the city of Shanghai, and a lot of land, about the same area as mainland USA, it means that we have to be clever in the way we use our infrastructure money. And rather than every researcher having their own mediocre equipment, what we've done is clustered our investments together so that we have single world-class pieces of equipment that is shared. And we have a national research infrastructure roadmap that um, has been developed and you can find it on our, in, our internet site in Australia. And it's, we also have a collaborative, uh, national collaborative research infrastructure strategy. 
And this coordinates our national landmark, which is those big pieces of equipment and global research infrastructure on a whole of country basis. And importantly, Australia defines national research infrastructure, not just as the facilities and the equipment and resources, but also it needs to understand that we require experts to operate it. And this infrastructure can be physical like a supercomputer or a microscope, but it can also be intangibles like data collection and soft, um, software platforms. So as a result, the um, NCRIS or the National uh, Re, um, Collection of Research Infrastructure Strategy supports 24 funded infrastructure projects, which are led by organizations, including universities, publicly funded research organizations, as well as private companies. And it's proven to be a most effective way to make sure that research community in Australia has access to the best possible research equipment providing merit-based access for all Australian researchers, but also internationally. So in a census in 2020, we found that 51,000 Australian uh, uh, researchers were accessing this equipment and 10,000 international um, users as well. And just to finish off, I want to provide one example. And this is the um, Australian Research Data Commons. Um, as we know, data is becoming more and more important and making it accessible, managed and stored is um, becoming something that requires its own infrastructure. And that means we need to remember that research infrastructure is not is about software as well as hardware. And the Australian Research Data Commons is an NCRIS enabled company that drives the development of national digital research infrastructure to provide Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. So what does this look like? Well, it optimizes, for example, our mango season. In Australia, we have lots of mangoes and the Australian Research Data Commons supported researchers in the central part of Queensland to develop an innovative product, which they call Fruit Maps. And it actually enables the translation of data from sensors located in mango farms to help farmers better estimate the size of crops and the best time for harvesting. Now it lets them employ the optimal number of pickers and packers at, at an ideal time. So looking forward, there's so much going on in the world of research infrastructure between new and emerging technologies, changing the ways of working and shifting global realities. As research infrastructure proponents, we have to keep our minds open to the changes that they bring. So one of the things which I need to consider is coming out of uh, the pandemic, what that impact was of it and how we react to that in the future. What the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence will have as we gather data and be able to use that. We know that quantum is becoming and quantum technologies are becoming a greater influence and with greater investment will be something that touches every researcher and every infrastructure. Techniques such as CRISPR, automation, uh, global uh, supply chains and how we support collections and libraries are all really critical. And finally, as we move towards open science with open access and open data, we need to remember how best we can manage all this. So I hope that the uh, 231st big thing in Australia will be the SKA when it's delivered to the global community. And I hope that you'll all want to come and tour Western Australia and desert so that you too can see some of the big infrastructure that we hold in Australia. Thank you very much. Dr. Foley, before we go to the debate and to the difficult questions and serious questions I need to ask, if you could build one big thing in Australia and not a research infrastructure, what would you build? And oh. keep in mind that potato is taken. <laughs> um, my favorite uh, uh, fauna is the flannel flower. It's a beautiful flower. It's a little bit like an edelweiss, but a little bit bigger. It's, uh, I'd probably make the big flannel flower. Okay, so anybody who is planning to go to Australia, wait till the flower is up. <laughs> All right, Daniel, we'll wait. We'll, we'll get that going. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will, I, I will take it as a promise.
<laughs> oh dear. That way, I would like to keep Dr. Foley on stage virtually and physically. I would like to ask uh, Vladimir Balash, as well as Clara Samson, uh, Claudia Romano, and uh, Imran Patel to join me on stage to take part in the debate. I do believe that Senior Razzo is online as well and is joining us for the debate. You have been asking questions, and uh, please do not hesitate to ask even here on site. If you have any question, please just raise your hand, just uh, attract my attention. I will give you the, the floor to you can ask the questions. Please, ladies, if you could go in the middle, so we can follow all the, eti all the etiquette. You don't want to sit closer to me. No, no. Should I take I it personally? <laughs> please, take the seat to... No, Minister, the ladies are in the middle. Am I right, Minister? <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us for the debate here in, uh, in Brno as well as online. The first question concerns what you were talking about. I would like you to share your experience because you all were talking, talking about the challenges we face. We face the challenge of the post-pandemic post world. We face the challenge of uh, uh, global troubles because of the geopolitical situation, disruption of supply chain, naturally the, the war in Ukraine caused by Russia, we face energy crisis. What is your experience you can share? How do you tackle these issues? Please, grab the microphone too, we can hear you nicely. I, I think the first point is to broaden the debate just from research infrastructures to science, technology and innovation policy in general. And I think many countries are moving in this direction, including South Africa, and that's the missions approach or the challenge approach uh, to doing work. I think there's examples of this there's, that has happened, but we need to, in fact, accelerate it in a much bigger way. Uh, starting with the end in mind. So, for example, if we're talking about a, a low carbon economy and we have, in the case of South Africa, not only looking at how to get to a low carbon economy, but what are the implications of the low carbon economy on our existing structures, which asks of us to look at questions of the just transition. So in that context, you need a series of things uh, that needs to be done on the science, technology, and innovation front. And one of them is research infrastructure. What exactly would be the research infrastructures, whether it's, for example, detailed uh, uh, innovation uh, research infrastructures, say, around battery technologies, or it's social science type research infrastructures you would need to have. So the, I think the core issue is increasingly we need to find those points of intersection between countries that are all uh, working towards the same missions and challenges, and in that context then to look at what the research infrastructures are. So to find a common solution to find a common solution for not only one state, not only for one research infrastructure, but find something that can fit all, or at least majority of them. Do I understand you correctly? I, I'm not too sure if it, it's an issue of one solution. Mm -hmm. I think countries are gonna have to evolve their own solutions, but where we can share certain uh, 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 technologies. COVID was a very good response, where it was clear from the start there were many uh, agencies that were competing to get the, to the first vaccine, but certain things were made global goods in a sense to accelerate the speed. Because I don't think we'll ever get to a situation in the world, even with international cooperation, that countries don't have their own electorate and their own uh, 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 conditions to look, look for. But I think increasingly there are areas that we can reach cooperation. And clearly, the big ones are health pandemics, climate change, etc. And there are opportunities in those spaces even in, in others that may be a bit more difficult. So it's not one solution, it's providing the enabling environment for each country to then evolve its, its, its own solutions. So give the tools, yes. share the tools, and let it work out in the best possible way for the precise scenario that the, uh, the, the infrastructure or the country is facing. Ms. Romano. Yes, I, I think that the solution is in our hands. It's not political declaration, because what happened, perhaps someone say in this opening day, the infrastructure is too expensive. For example, in Latin America, we can select one or two or three, but we have to join and work together and inform complementary form. Why? Because the international cooperation is, is the key for me, is the key and try to open the infrastructure in the different areas. 
when we were talking in a few minutes before the meeting, we were talking what are the main challenges that we have to, to work in. Climate change, development areas, health, this is the different topics that we have to, to work together and making a synergies. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Samson, could you share your experience, the lessons learned, how to tackle the situation that we are facing because of the geopolitical situation? For the geopolitical situation, well, you, how come I get the difficult questions? I was preparing to answer the question about challenges, and I'm going to go on that one, okay? You know, you know how this panel was created, you know? We, we said, okay, we have difficult questions. Let's find those who will give us the answers. Oh, dear. Okay, um, so I think we're all coming out of a difficult period, uh, but I don't like to dwell on the problem or the negativity. I think it provided us with lots of opportunities, and now we have to use this as a springboard to go forward. And I will give two examples that are coming to my mind. First is this conference. If I understand well, this conference used to be a conference very much of specialists coming together, small number of specialists. Well, going virtual last time and going hybrid this time has made it possible to really broaden the audience. And this is the kind of very practical thing that I think will bear fruit in the future because collaboration comes with people. And when people have like the tools to participate to something together, then it happens. Um, another example that comes to mind, and this is after uh, doing a side event this morning, is we have noticed in, um, I'm from a funding agency, so I receive good ideas from researchers. And many of them are um, going into robotic systems so that their labs can be operated remotely. And that's a heavy trend also that in the future will open the doors of these expensive infrastructures to a larger base of users. And uh, I can see this as an immense opportunity to work forward together as my colleagues are mentioning. Mm -hmm. And you were worried that I gave you a difficult question. Yeah, well, I, I didn't want to do the geopolitics one because I'm just from Canada and we're standing an iceberg somewhere, you know, in the north. Canada is an amazing country. Thank you. from experience. Let's go for the experience to Australia. Mrs. Foley, your perspective, please. So, um, I, look, it's, it's really interesting that there's two things we've heard about. One is how... COVID has really, ch and the pandemic has really changed the way we think about that international engagement. And that, you know, we're able to have me join your conference in Australia, you know, it might be the middle of the night, and still able to join and engage. And, um, and this is something which I think has a real potential to enable science to go beyond the geopolitics and be able to join up without necessarily having to have access to um, equipment itself and that is where I want to bring the other idea that um, was just mentioned by Claire of automation in laboratories. So I'll, I'm probably not explaining this very well but last year we had the International Women in Physics Conference which was delayed because of COVID and we ended up doing it online and instead of having um, 300 women coming into a conference from a few few countries, we actually had nearly 400 women from 80 different countries, many of whom would never be able to travel from some of the poorest nations, uh, from countries that just cannot get visas uh, and travel is, a, is not a possibility. But by using digital platforms, they were able to engage from whether it was countries like Rwanda, Cuba, uh, South America, uh, I mean, South Africa, and uh, 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 Pakistan. So it was a, a huge array of different countries. But we ended up, because of everyone coming in on a digital platform, it didn't matter whether you're from a high GDP country or a low GDP country, you were just a digital person engaged. And it was a very great level up, which I thought was a major impact in the way of creating, first of all, a, a level playing field for collaboration. 
But then the next thing which I found was interesting, and we followed up and following up with this, is that then we can create the collaboration. So although someone can't travel, they still have great ideas. And by using the design and open access of, a, of a large scale equipment, being able to, um, uh, I, I call it a conceptual scientist. You have conceptual artists, they design something and another artist makes it. Well, we can have conceptual scientists design the experiments but they can be done by an automated lab or by uh, someone in another country who's an expert being able to manipulate a, um, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I think by doing it, it will cut across a lot of the geopolitics. You know that science is, is the pathway to uh, soft diplomacy. And it's that one-to-one -one relationship that is, I think, the way forward where science has a pathway to keep the world being are more connected even at a time when there's some fracturing going on. Mm -hmm. This is the perspective from the scientists and the agencies that help to the scientists. What about the perspective of politicians and political institutions that help scientists to tackle the situation? Let's start on the Czech level. Mr. Balash, we have described the challenges. Uh, Mr. Patel described the tools that are potentially needed to tackle those challenges. What can the politics, what can the politicians offer to make these tools a reality? Mm -hmm. Now that's also quite an interesting question. I think, uh, first of all, I would think that uh, politicians should understand that uh, life is longer than their um, stay in function. So, <laughs> so they, they don't have to think in one, two or four years. And especially in, in fundamental research, they should uh, admit that financing of science should be long lasting and uh, uh, and that's foreseeable, in fact, and uh, they should not stay in the way of scientists. They, but they are not here to tell scientists what should they really do and uh, uh, where, whether they should uh, deal with this or that issue. But uh, uh, because, well, uh, as I understand, scientists also live in, in real world. They know uh, what are challenges and they know what might be interesting uh, to, uh, to uh, research and, uh, and they are also able, uh, quite flexible and, and quickly react on, on, on challenges that are really very acute and we've been really facing this uh, during the COVID-19 pandemics because uh, what, what really uh, the science brought and, 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 this, and, and, and the in very short short terms was amazing so they brought solutions diagnostics vaccines almost instantly and it, it, this is something that should persuade uh, politicians uh, not to harm uh, research and uh, really support it and not to tell scientists what they should do and and uh, and uh, as, as i say well this is also uh, important uh, to think globally, although uh, well, we can feel that there are some, uh, some global issues we solve, uh, there is some threats, uh, there is a uh, problem with, with security issues, but uh, still, uh, I don't know uh, how long you, 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 uh, uh, you traveled to Brno, but irrespective of that, the world is becoming smaller and smaller. So, and uh, if we don't share the knowledge, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really problem that will appear sooner or later. If, 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 it, if, it, if, it, if there is a problem in, in some part of the world, it appears sooner or later in another, in, in some way. So uh, th this is what, what you, you, you said. It's, it's also an important issue of politicians and international cooperation. And, and I also understand that there are some security risks and, and whatever, but, but I don't think that the science cut borders. So, and uh, this is, if, if you want really to use, use the potential uh, scientists have, we should really bring them together. And I think uh, they are other humanists, so they, they know uh, what, what the ethics is and uh, mm -hmm. they are really able to help us. So I don't think uh, we, we, should, we shouldn't stay in their, in their way to, to do what they, they know uh, much better than politicians. And I think it would be sufficient and, and just support it, so. Okay, so what you are proposing that politicians do in this situation is prepare stable financing, stable financing in long term, not in yeah. short term. Yeah, yeah. 
long-term uh, stability, financial, financial stability. Secondly, politicians should not get in the way of scientists. Yeah. Just let them work and don't make them fight the bureaucratic wars and political wars. Exactly. Am I right? Yes. And thirdly, you are saying uh, we need to help them to cooperate. That's yeah. our goal and our task. Exactly. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you said it my, much, much better than I do, so... No, <laughs> <laughs> I was just summarizing, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I would like to use what you said... Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. ...and go directly yeah, to uh, uh, Mrs. Ratso and ask her how European Union, how European Union, if you, naturally, agree with these steps, is fulfilling these steps. What kind of steps will be done by European Commission to fulfill these steps that were just described by uh, the Ministry of Youth Education of the country that is holding right now the presidency of European Union. Mrs. Sinjerutso, please. Well, many, uh, many thanks. Um, it's, my, it's my pleasure, as I said, to, to join in uh, the discussion. I would have loved to, to join you in Brno and also have to have the advantage of, uh, of seeing some of the infrastructures that you will be able to see there. Uh, I, I could do that actually in Prague as, as part of the the, the program of another uh, presidency event. Uh, and, and now also, Cathy uh, gave a very nice teaser to the <laughs> research infrastructures in, uh, in, in Australia. Um, I've been dealing with international collaboration for the whole of my career, now for the uh, last 16 years in the European Commission, but previously also working for the Estonian government and uh, also working for Estonia's accession uh, to, the, uh, to the EU. Uh, now, uh, our uh, program, Horizon Europe program, as you know, is the largest international collaboration program uh, uh, worldwide, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the budget of nearly 100 uh, uh, billion euros for the, uh, for, the, for the next seven years. And it's also open to the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad uh, to participate in this conference because uh, research infrastructures and also the other panel speakers uh, pointed out are the, the natural way of collaborating internationally because none of us can afford actually to have all necessary infrastructures uh, and that, that's why we actually need to, to collaborate uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the global goods. Now, as uh, the, uh, the, the question was about uh, the new uh, geopolitical situation, um, I, and, and you also highlighted all these different factors uh, that uh, we now also need to address in the EU, but also globally. I believe that all these factors make global collaboration in research infrastructures more relevant than ever. And the pandemic showed uh, that research infrastructures could catalyze international scientific cooperation and also maximize uh, impact. Uh, now, perhaps uh, also coming back to the, uh, to the, uh, the point that, that Claire made, well, you said that it was a difficult question. However, I think that under the, the, the current geopolitical situation, we really need to join forces together uh, in order to really address uh, the, the issues at hand. And that's what we are doing. We are doing that via the collaboration uh, with our program, but also by need, means of associating like-minded countries to our program. And I'm glad to admit that we hope very soon uh, to, to start uh, the um, uh, also negotiations with Canada uh, for future association to the program and I still hope that perhaps Australia would be interested also to do the same in the in the future. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, now we saw that with the um, European COVID-19 data platform allowed researchers worldwide to deposit and share research data. With the European Virus Archive facilitated the analysis of SARS uh, COV-2 virus strain supported development of diagnostic techniques, especially early in the pandemic. Now we are in another crisis, perhaps more challenging than ever the war in Ukraine. And let me just uh, spend um, a moment of highlighting uh, what we do on the Commission side, uh, on the EU side, to support Ukraine's research community. First, Ukraine's association with our programs Horizon Europe, but also Euratom, 
represents a key instrument to support Ukrainian actors who remain in the country. Uh, a month ago, we launched a 25 million call to provide fellowships for doctoral candidates, postdoctoral researchers from Ukraine. We also support European Innovation Council, uh, Ukrainian uh, startups uh, to keep afloat. Now, I encourage you to actively also pursue cooperation opportunities with Ukrainian partners uh, in uh, the research infrastructures. As uh, Ukrainian researchers, uh, innovators need fast track access uh, to the research infrastructure through uh, short term stays, also training opportunities. So the spirit of solidarity with Ukraine must remain uh, firm. And uh, really, I count on uh, or the research infrastructure community uh, to uh, continue to support anything that you can do in this uh, this way. Now, I'd also like to highlight climate change and energy, because we need to step up collaboration in global research infrastructures for global environmental monitoring, environmental sustainability. Uh, and also, uh, it's clear that in the short term, energy supply is the pressing challenge this winter here in Europe, but also in many other places. Uh, and uh, air eyes uh, are already preparing the contingency plan. But in the longer term, we also uh, need uh, to, um, uh, to improve the performance. European synchrotron radiation facility, for instance, uh, has shown that it can gain 100% performance while reducing energy consumption by 30%. Uh, so the carbon footprint of the facilities must also be considered seriously. So Horizon Europe there uh, is there to support those on the path to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50, 50, uh, 55 percent by 2030. So we have a lot of potential uh, to collaborate uh, internationally uh, in all the, the challenges that have been highlighted by, by all the, the panel people. Thank you. Okay, I would like to follow up on what you said. Let me, let me set the scene that I have heard to be described by some of the managers of uh, the research infrastructures. They say, okay, this is the reality I'm living in as a manager right now in 2022. I have the energy crisis. The prices of energy is rising up. I need to figure out how to survive the winter, not concerning freezing to death, but to make sure that I know how I'm paying for the electricity, how I'm paying for the energy. And I need to figure out that if I can shut down part of my projects, I can keep the people. Or I can keep the people or I will have to you know, shut down permanently. I can, for example, if I, have, if I have research infrastructure concerning lasers, I can shut down the lasers for a bit. But I cannot stop tending for my hamsters or mice. So I need to find a place and find a way how to survive financially. And that's why I would like to talk about right now, what are the steps to be taken to make it happen for just the research infrastructures? What is right now? And if you please, Director General, could just make a taxation, just you know, name the steps that are right now available for the research infrastructures to help in this particular situation that we are right now, to tackle it in the short term what are the steps that were taken and what are the possibilities for research infrastructures to get help from the European Commission? We lost sound for a bit. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Ratzel, uh, can we, can, yeah, we can hear you, perfect, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, several European laboratories are already working on this. Uh, really, they need to prepare the contingency plans because the, uh, really the, uh, also, uh, there are the different circumstances and they, they also have uh, the, also the, the different uh, designs and different plans. Certainly, uh, also in a longer term, uh, these factors need to be carefully taken into account in the design of the new facilities. We know that there are already innovative solutions uh, which are available on the market which uh, enable uh, the companies, including research infrastructures, to reduce the energy costs. Uh, and certainly uh, these uh, would be the ones uh, to, be, uh, to, be looked, uh, to be looked into. Uh, and certainly, as, as you know, there are in general, uh, the, the discussions uh, actually happening uh, at, the, at the level 
Now I'm afraid we lost not only the sound, but also the connection as a whole. But hopefully, Director General will be back online in a moment's time. In the meanwhile, uh, Mr. Patel, uh, what are your recommendations? As I have mentioned, you are the man who cares about public policy and strategy management. What are your takes on what to do right now? What is your recommendation? What is the lesson to be learned for the others to tackle the situation? Um, moderate uh, uh, recommendations on what? On the current situation concerning the energy crisis, specifically concerning research infrastructures. Okay. What kind of piece of advice you can offer? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure that we can always rush to short-term solutions for long-term uh, long measures. I, I think clearly we need to, uh, because unlike the COVID-19 crisis where it was clear and present danger, and it provided the catalyst to cooperate. I think we're going to have to take a medium to long-term perspective on energy, notwithstanding the current crisis in Europe around energy supply. I think that long-term trajectory towards much more uh, stronger renewable energy, et cetera, uh, different forms of energy, energy efficiency, uh, is the direction we need to go into. Whether we have sufficient research infrastructures, uh, to help us in that journey. I'm not too sure, I'm not the specialist in that, in that regard. I'm sure the audience who are working in that space can, can, can advise on it. But clearly, if we, if we um, um, buy into the, the general commitment that uh, is gonna be uh, uh, continued in, in, in Sharm El Sheikh in a, in a couple of weeks time and the Paris Declaration, what is clear is we need to accelerate. That, that much is clear. We need to do a lot more, not necessarily only on the research infrastructure side. In fact, I, I've been told that in some instances, there are available technologies. It's about the deployment and diffusion. So as I had made the comment earlier, even though the focus of this conference is on research infrastructures, some of the debates needs to be broader what needs to be done, and then to find the relevant place for research infrastructures. There may be other places where research infrastructures may, may have a, a greater impact. Is it on energy? I don't know. These are not, not questions that I think it's possible to answer. You need to pull in the specialists, et cetera. In areas like health, in areas, uh, say, around marine, uh, marine resources, circular economy, definitely I can see the need for, ex for, 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 for building on and strengthening research infrastructures, and to do it in such a way that we understand, uh, uh, for example, in the case of marines and oceans, that we have one world, and that there's an imbalance in the availability of research capabilities and research infrastructures, depending on the country you're in. That needs a global response, it needs some kind of a global approach. Energy, not necessarily sure, because there's also a lot of technology types, uh, technology areas. So that, that's my kind of uh, high-level thinking at this point in time. Mrs. Sampson, you wanted to react, please. Uh, yes, so um, in Canada, we are fortunate that we are not in an immediate crisis. But that being said, we're very aware. So in the medium term, we are thinking about um, changing um, or adjusting the criteria by which we actually um, declare a project meritorious for funding. Uh, a few years ago, it was, um, the emphasis was on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we um, change our parameters to raise the profile of that criterion so that the applicants that are uh, applying for having a research infrastructure or an instrument, they build that in their thinking from day one. Mm -hmm. So now the energy can be um, considered into the broader thing of um, um, climate change and the uh, respect of the environment. So we are thinking possibly of introducing adjudication criteria in that sense, mm -hmm. so that when people apply for instruments, they do the thinking, oh, uh, should I go this route or that route, and what are the longer term implication about the operating cost of that instrument? Mm -hmm. So it's a very practical way of going forward, but again, we have a little bit more luxury of time. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will be difficult to prepare the rules to make it you know, fair for everybody? 
Yes, it's like we're struggling with the mechanics of it, but I think the principle has a lot of merit. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Foley, please, what's the perspective for Australia? I do have a piece of advice how to tackle this. So uh, one of the biggest issues which I think many of us have not come to terms with is the scale that is needed to have the energy transition for us to uh, deliver on climate change and then the flow on that has of equity in energy production uh, provision as well as uh, looking at just the disruption it's going to create. I'll give you an example. A report came out a couple of a month or so ago uh, that said that Australia needs to cover four times the size, of, no, five times the size of Tasmania. Do you know Tasmania is that small island state at the south of Australia? Five times that area has to be covered in uh, in uh, solar panels if we are to uh, to have uh, the energy transition that we're planning, and they're actually planning to do that. Now, if we're going to do, if you think about by you need to get this done by a certain time. The volume of equipment materials, the people who are going to make this, the, the, and this is just Australia, which is a small country. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it's mind blowing to think, have we got the ability to do this internationally? What are we going to be doing for countries that don't have, we have lots of solar, so that's not the issue. We've got wind as well. We're developing hydrogen and using that, um, that solar power to split water to be able to create hydrogen and then ship that. But the thing that's interesting is that we're not lined up nationally to be able to see how every country plays a part in the energy transition. And I'm getting a sense that we've got every country trying to figure, or, or um, different, like the EU and um, Asia, um, Australia, Americas, so doing their own thing, and I think we're, what we're missing is that coordination so that we're able to have a better staff at that. And this also requires large infrastructure, research infrastructure, because we need to invent the new catalysts, the new battery materials, um, and new devices that are low energy, because we've talked a lot about um, the importance of data and how that's going to be a very important part of just the way we operate. But we know that electronics and we know that uh, high power computing are very energy intensive. And so as we go more digital, we're actually increasing energy needs as well. And so how we can develop low energy computing is important. The impact of quantum and quantum computing will be important. And all these need to be built together to really help us deliver on this massive, I think, existential requirement for us as humans. Can I shortly come back now? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Connected again. Now, now I think it's it's actually very good to uh, to to come back um, uh, at this point now that that also Kathy has been has been speaking and also the others. Uh, now, first of all, what I'd like to highlight is that um, uh, now this this crisis has also shown us uh, that. Uh, we should actually need to accelerate energy transition rather than to, to put a stop on that. Uh, because if uh, we had been doing better uh, until now, then we wouldn't have been in such a dire situation, being well totally dependent or very much dependent on the, on the energy uh, imports from one country. Uh, what we are doing already uh, in the EU, but also in collaboration with international partners, uh, is uh, now very much of developing uh, and also then uh, bringing to the market uh, the available technologies, uh, developing them further, but also then bringing to the market. Uh, I'd like to highlight hydrogen because now we have several actions, both in our program, but also in the EU, uh, but also in collaboration with, uh, with our international partners. I'd like to highlight mission innovation where hydrogen, uh, and I know there are uh, uh, also quite a few countries represented here, who are partners of in mission innovation, and there there is also a particular focus on uh, on hydrogen. Uh, now the question is what uh, to do in the short term uh, now uh, in order to help, uh, and there are certainly as 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 the the European side knows there are the discussions at the head of state. Uh, uh, heads of governments level uh, on the European measures 
uh, to support uh, in the in the current energy crisis. But there is also uh, something what we can do uh, with the research. Uh, now, I'd like to mention uh, one. Uh, well, the uh, the the call uh, which we prepared for the next work program. But what now we are reflecting? Perhaps this is the time actually now to anticipate that. Uh, namely, the, the call concerning reduction of environmental, including climate-related impacts, as well as optimization of resource and energy consumption, which would be certainly something which would be of interest for the um, infrastructures. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Romano, I would like to ask you for your expertise, because you have over three decades of experience concerning the international cooperation. What is right now, what are, not is, because there will not be just one, bottlenecks? concerning the policy making process and the policy makers potentially to deal with this current situation? What are the bottlenecks and what are the solutions from your perspective? I don't have the solution, of course. If I have the solution... Of course! I, stay I was in counting place. on you. Okay. <laughs> but I have some idea that could be important. I think that in the region, not only in the LAC region, in whole the, the, the global mm -hmm. uh, countries, we have a very different way to support the research infrastructure. For example, for the international organization, a different agency funding, a different program, but most of them are in, in, in ways separated. Mm -hmm. It's necessary to coordinate and to try to work together with the policy maker. It's necessary to work together, the researcher, the manager, the policy maker, because to make the policy, to make the public policy, is necessary to have a long-term mm -hmm. uh, vision. But what happened in our countries, the politicians stay only four years or five. Then you can start, you start to work in, in this way, but change the, the, the government, and you have to start again some of the place. What is important in this way, trying to work with the research infrastructure, with the university, with the private se sector, because it's necessary to join our effort. Mm -hmm. The budget is, is limit. Mm -hmm. it's, necessary, it's necessary to work together and articulate. For example, the European Commission have the Horizon 2020. Well, to, tomorrow that morning, we heard a lot of projects from research infrastructure that have funding from the, this, this program. Mm -hmm. But what we can do to add value, another step, to add value to funding this, uh, to, to add value to this process that we are doing in all the region. Mm -hmm. And open your mind, open our mind, and try really to coordinate, to articulate, around the world, really articulate, not only in this discourse, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are poli most of political, sorry, not for you, of course, <laughs> the other. Uh, you said that, not he, not no, me. No, 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 okay. okay. I say <laughs> it. Uh, have a, uh, correctly a dis discourse, the course of politically correct policy, mm -hmm. uh, correctly politic. But in real, when you say, how how uh, how what is your support for the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. How is the budget? Mm -hmm. We know that the budget not is the most important in the world, but mm -hmm. it's important. Mm -hmm. And what is from the perspective of politician? That's for me. Yeah, yeah th that's for you. <laughs> the next step. You know how to make sure that you can secure what you were aiming for the scientists and for Mrs. Romano just described as something that's absolutely crucial. The stability concerning the financing, concerning the way how to work and uh, the place for collaboration. How do you secure that? Well, there are many. Just so, so, a bit, so, my sorry, sorry, there are probably many ways how to secure that. I think uh, that politicians should uh, start to think as a, as a rational businessman first. Mm -hmm. So what uh, rational businessman uh, is doing when there is crisis he invests what, in what he invests in some innovations in research. Why? Because it can materialize after a uh, crisis is over. And I think this is what I would recommend politicians and uh, to our government uh, to invest in research and innovation because uh, it's also the only 
chance how to overcome, let's say, even energy crisis because it's not up to the uh, politicians to, to invent what to do, how to replace energy, uh, how to clean it up. And uh, it's good to, to ask someone who understands that. So, mm -hmm. do, you uh, have, do you have somebody you can ask? Oh, yeah, I think we get plenty of very talented people. Uh, they are dealing with different issues, but uh, we, we, we've heard about uh, hydrogen uh, and, and transition in this area. And uh, I think uh, that uh, the, the Green Deal and sustainable development is, is not impolite word, it's big chance. So, I mean, if we invest in this area, it can be multiplied uh, when uh, we will ask uh, how we sort it out with, with the, the problem. So, I mean, this is quite rational and natural. I, I, well, I, even, uh, I, I even wonder uh, why you ask about it. So. Why really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really? No, really. <laughs> no, I understand. Glad to hear that. <laughs> I will keep that in mind for future questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, that's true. Uh, I, and I think, uh, we, we, as I said uh, at the very beginning, uh, we don't have to build up obstacles to science because if we mm -hmm. want solutions, we should support science. That's the only answer. I was intrigued by the reaction by Claire Samson when you said that you need to act as crisis managers. She said nothing, but she was like, yeah, well, why? Um, we are uh, at a moment of change, and uh, one of the changes, the many ones, is the change in demography. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, I'm an old crusty boomer, and uh, soon we'll take retirement, right? And I think our research infrastructures are like a very, very rich and vibrant environment for training the next generation of scientists. And if there is one card we can play to lobby our governments, lobby the private sector, the private sector is hungry for talent. Mm -hmm. And this might be uh, one of the many avenues we can all pursue is to find ways to um, maybe broadcast more uh, our impact and our outcomes from our research infrastructures to the society in general, to the public sector, is say, yes, we generate, we generate ideas, we generate patents, intellectual proper property, but we generate the next generation of talent and engineers and scientists, and I think, yeah, I think, yeah, that's the card to play. The card of the future is via the people of the future. That is also an invitation for tomorrow's debate concerning communication of research infrastructures. And we will talk about this in a greater detail. I do agree strongly. And it's also the political task to make it truly really happen. That's true. By chance, I'm Minister of Education, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by a simple chance, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's, it's quite a crucial role. I, well, they say it's not very important uh, post opposition in our government. And Who said that? Well, people, or some politicians, and I, but uh, I think it's quite crucial because uh, if we invest in, in education and we improve the system, if we make it more effective, more attractive, uh, then we can really get out of many problems and uh, we can make our lives better. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what, what we currently are doing, actually. We are changing uh, atmosphere in our school. We, we are trying to, to change framework uh, learning programs, uh, but uh, it's just one part of it. So you also need to persuade the teachers. You, you should train them properly and whatever. And, and, and to me, it's really the that similarly as with the, with the science, with the research, uh, the, the investment in education is really one of the best investment any government can do. So this is uh, what I agree. So that's why we have at the Ministry of Education also science partly, but uh, and, and that it, it is said definitely that, that and, and in Poland they say that, that the good elementary school is 
perhaps even more important than good universities. So, so it starts somewhere, of course, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, to diminish the role of universities, definitely. And, but uh, if you have good students coming from secondary school or from, from elementary mm -hmm. school, so uh, the easier work is it uh, at the university level and, and, and more, uh, more uh, young scientists uh, you can attract. So this is really interconnected, definitely. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah. uh, that's it. I, 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 I do understand. I would like to ask two questions that were sent by, uh, the, by the viewers uh, that are joining us online, uh, that are prepared for Senior Razzo. Uh, please, Director General, the first question. How do we deal with large international shared research infrastructures in a situation dominated by geopolitical issues such as the war on Ukraine? Who gets access and who not? And who decides? Uh, well, <laughs> before coming to that question, because I, I, I was very intrigued uh, by, the, by the discussion before, uh, let me just um, also make a, a few points uh, as a, as a, as a follow-up of, of the, the points by the, the panelists. First of all, um, I, was, I was really very glad to hear uh, from, uh, from Minister Balash uh, that you highlighted the importance of investing in research and innovation. Because clearly this is uh, that we need in Europe. I mentioned that we have Horizon Europe program, which is the, the largest international collaboration program. However, it's less than 10% of overall investments in the EU. Uh, if we also take, uh, take into account uh, the investments by EU member states. But we know that there is still a, a, a lot of room for improvement uh, also uh, in order to increase uh, the R&I investments uh, in, the, in the member state side. Uh, research infrastructures are actually strategic investments for Europe, and this is why they are one of the pillars of the European research area. Uh, and this is why uh, we also have a program facilitating their capacity building, uh, also funding transnational access to their services for two decades. That's why we made it possible also to have transnational uh, access, uh, access uh, there. Uh, now, as, um, uh, as it was, uh, it, it was uh, mentioned, the, the need uh, for, the, for the new generation and new skills, I'd also like to highlight that next year uh, is European Year of Skills. And it would be excellent if S3 would launch a training program dedicated, for instance, on the use of artificial intelligence, circular economy, or similar, all these skills that would be uh, also needed uh, for the uh, now for the uh, for the next uh, generation. And knowing that we already have many examples of educational local activities uh, uh, by laboratories, just as uh, CERN and ESFR. Uh, now, as to the question of the access, uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, certainly there we will need to take into account. Uh, the uh, clearly what is uh, now uh, the, uh, the 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 sanctions uh, related uh, to uh, to Russia and Russia's uh, Russia's um, uh, uh, aggression against Ukraine and certainly this needs to be taken into account concerning also the access to to research infrastructures. Okay, one more question for you, uh, Ms. Ratso. Uh, Jan Hayic is asking. Thank you for mentioning multilinguality at the end of your intro. As someone from the Clarin Research Infrastructure, I would be interested in how the Commission is going to support language technology research to achieve true multilinguality in Europe. I don't think that I mentioned multilinguality, <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless... Well, Mr. Uh, Hayek nevertheless... is, is, is hoping you did, actually. <laughs> okay. If, you, if no, you don't think so, and if you do not support that, just no, 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 really no, state no, it, no, don't no, I, I would be happy. No, I would be happy to reply. No, I just don't recall that I mentioned it. Uh, but, but you know, we, we, have the, we have in the multilinguality is, is part of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the EU that we translate uh, all uh, the, uh, the the official documents uh, into all uh, EU languages, uh, and uh, and and also provide the the information also um, in uh, in EU all EU languages. I would uh, also uh, perhaps highlight uh, that we we had uh, now related uh, to the um, uh, to the, um, uh, the the public. Um, uh, 
citizen engagement uh, last uh, last year uh, related discussing for the uh, for the future uh, of the EU. Uh, then we also had the, the platforms which enabled uh, also the translation into all EU languages. If that was the it, if that was the, the question, we certainly okay. continue to have this policy at the at the EU level. To sum up the whole debate, thank you for attending, thank you for sharing your experience. I give you floor for one sentence to wrap it up. The most important thing you want to everybody to remember from you personally, what is the word to, what is the word to remember? Dr. Foley, what's your final word, please? Um, I think uh, my final word is that infrastructure is absolutely critical for humanity's existence because if you look at the things that we need to do to travel to deal with the world around us things we have to understand things we have to invent and knowledge we need to gain uh, it is the infrastructure that will lead us there says Cathy Foley Australia's chief scientist thank you very much for joining us have a great day thank you Mr. Pato, final word. What do you want to everybody to, uh, to remember? Three words, accelerate for impact. Accelerate for? Impact. For impact, says Imran Pato, Deputy Director General of Research, Development and Support from South African Department of Science and Innovation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Claire Samson. Thank you. Um, I will go in the same direction. I have felt a lot of energy in this um, room today. I see people happy to see each other after a long time. And I, I say, let's use this energy to create momentum. And let's take this momentum in our suitcase when we go home. <laughs> Claire Samson, Vice President for Programs and Planning, Canada Foundation for Innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mrs. Romano. Communication. Try to show all that the infrastructure do, because they do a lot of, but the common people and sometimes the politi politicians don't understand. And I think that they do a lot of things, but they speak in the same languages, but the people that are, are not scientific can don't, don't understand. For, for that, lobby, work, to lobby, work together, share information, uh, Open your mind, put in the other on the other feet. It's necessary to work together, and I think that we are in this in the best way. Thank you. Claudia Romano, manager of the Uruguayan Agency for International Cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Balash. Uh, I think uh, get public at large uh, at your side and explain them how important it is. I mean, I infrastructures are unique way how to put scientists together how to make science more effective. And I think uh, Daniel's got a splendid uh, TV show, Hyde Park of Civilization, and he's one who is explaining how important the science is and what achievement it brought to the mankind. So thank you, Daniel. This was not planned. Vladimir <laughs> Balanch, <laughs> the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports of the Czech Republic. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Director General, Senior Razzo. Now, I would just add one sentence. International collaboration, striving for excellence in the interest of the global good for the humanity and impact on societies. Thank you very much. Senior Razzo, <laughs> Acting Director General of Research, Development and Sub Sorry. Of, uh, Director General of uh, Directorate of Research and Innovation representing the European Commission. Thank you very much for joining us for the debate. Do not hesitate to wait for the, the coffee break to start because that's what's ahead of us. We have 30 minutes to refresh to make sure that you are ready for the two more topics that are ahead of us. The place for the coffee break is over there behind this behind these door as well as in the first in the first on the first floor. Make sure that you are back at four because at four we are starting at the debate or the opening uh, talks concerning two more topics. So at four, we are going on. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. You are great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.